Letter number two of the Silence Do Good Letters by Benjamin Franklin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the author of the New England Current. Sir, histories of lives are seldom entertaining unless they contain something either admirable or exemplar. And since there is little or nothing of this nature in my own adventures, I will not tire your readers with tedious particulars of no consequence but will briefly and in as few words as possible relate the most material occurrences of my life, and according to my promise, confine all to this letter. My reverend master, who had hitherto remained a bachelor, after much meditation on the eighteenth verse of the second chapter of Genesis, took up a resolution to marry, and having made several unsuccessful fruitless attempts on the more topping sort of our sex, and being tired with making troublesome journeys and visits to no purpose, he began unexpectedly to cast a loving eye upon me, whom he had brought up cleverly to his hand. There is certainly scarce any part of a man's life in which he appears more silly and ridiculous than when he makes his first onset in courtship. The awkward manner in which my master first discovered his intentions made me, in spite of my reverence to his person, burst out into unmannerly laughter. However, having asked his pardon, and with much ado composed my countenance, I promised him I would take his proposal into serious consideration, and speedily give him an answer. As he had been a great benefactor, and in a manner of father to me, I could not well deny his request when I once perceived he was in earnest. Whether it was love, or gratitude, or pride, or all three that made me consent, I know not. But it is certain he found it no hard matter, by the help of his rhetoric, to conquer my heart and persuade me to marry him. This unexpected match was very astonishing to all the country round about and served to furnish them with discourse for a long time after, some approving it, others disliking it, as they were led by their various fancies and inclinations. We lived happily together in the height of conjugal love and mutual endearments, for near seven years, in which time we added two likely girls and a boy to the family of the do-goods. But alas, when my son was in its meridian altitude, inexorable unrelenting death, as if he had envied my happiness and tranquillity, and resolved to make me entirely miserable by the loss of so good an husband, hastened his flight to the heavenly world by a sudden, unexpected departure from this. I have now remained in a state of widowhood for several years, but it is a state I never much admired, and I am apt to fancy that I could be easily persuaded to marry again, provided I was sure of a good-humoured, sober, agreeable companion. But one, even with these few good qualities being hard to find, I have lately relinquished all thoughts of that nature. At present, I pass away my leisure hours in conversation, either with my honest neighbor Rusticus and his family, or with the ingenious minister of our town who now lodges at my house, and by whose assistance I intend now and then to beautify my writings with a sentence or two in learned languages, which will not only be fashionable and pleasing to those who do not understand it, but will likewise be very ornamental. I shall conclude this with my own character, which one would think I should be best able to give. Know, then, that I am an enemy to vice and a friend to virtue. I am one of an extensive charity and a great forgiver of private injuries, a hearty lover of the clergy and all good men, and a mortal enemy to arbitrary government and unlimited power. I am naturally very jealous for the rights and liberties of my country, and the least appearance of an encroachment on those invaluable privileges is apt to make my blood boil exceedingly. I have likewise a natural inclination to observe and reprove the faults of others, at which I have an excellent faculty. I speak this to all such whose offenses shall come under my cognizance, for I never intend to wrap my talent in a napkin. To be brief, I am courteous and affable, good-humoured unless I am first provoked, and handsome and sometimes witty, but always, sir, your friend and humble servant, silence do good. The New England Current, April 16th, 1722. End of letter number two. Recording by Darcy Smitinar.